Peter Cochran joined the General Post Office in 1962. Now, several degrees and numerous awards later, he has established himself as one of the most exciting and insightful technologists in the world today. Never afraid to air his views on bureaucracy and the stifling of progress, he is well known for predicting just how we'll live and work in years to come. And putting his money where his mouth is, he's also launched some 13 startups using his own money and weekend time. Yes, I am the long-range radar and I do experiments with people, with technology, with networks. I have no interest in the comfortable. I'm interested in what breaks people, what breaks systems and what breaks networks. So I explore where the boundaries are and then find reasonable levels of operation. In the dot-com world, if you don't reply to an email in hours, you're dead in the water. I work on a 12-hour cycle and so does my company. We have to respond quickly, otherwise the competition takes us out. I have to say that I'm not all that optimistic at seeing 3G as a major force in the UK ever. This is a fairly serious game of poker and some people are betting everything on this technology. If they can't find a solution, I think we will see companies collapse. I think we will see some serious consolidations and probably a fall in the no amount of competition in the market. Peter Cochran, I'm Chief Technologist of British Telecom, but I'm also a business angel, a founder of uh, eBookers in London and Concept Labs in California. What's true? I think it's true that the internet is allowing us to move from a world of concentrated skill and capability to a world of distributed ignorance, and a world of distributed <coughs> ignorance wins, but it's about networking. What's not true, and will never be true, it ain't free. We missed the absolute obvious. We had the model that people would pay to play games online, and they do. But then we found people in thousands were paying to watch. So it actually became the Wimbledon model, and really what we should have done was paid the star players to play online, and then got the other people to pay to watch. When that bandwidth is available right across the network everywhere, we will see a complete transformation of the gaming industry. Fifteen years ago, when I wanted to turn the volume up, I just did that. Now I have to have four clicks of a mouse to adjust the volume. I have uh, a car radio with multifunction buttons. I have a mobile phone with multifunction buttons. And the world's got very complex. When I go on to internet or when I go into a commercial library online, I have to spend a lot of time searching for the information I want. I would like to see the technology working for me instead of me working for the technology. It is not my job as a human being to make the search process simple for the computer. It should be the reverse. So my dream is to be able to get any information I want within three clicks of a mouse. What people worry about is security and privacy on the internet. The reality is it is the most secure, the most private means of communication that we've ever had, including fax, telephone, and paper mail. So there is an issue here about legality. If I send you something, is it me that is sending it you? Is it true? And what recourse in law do you have? Everything to do with IT grows exponentially. And even people in the industry like myself getting taken by surprise. If I say to you something doubles every year, then in 10 years it means it's going to be a thousand times bigger, and in 20 years a million times bigger. That's what's actually happening to computers in terms of their power, in terms of the numbers being sold, and it is certainly true of e-commerce, the trading of information, bits and money. Now the military war game a lot and have a war now and again. In business, what do we do? We're at war every day and we never play. In a world of chaos, it is going to be essential for us to war game, for us to understand, for us to play. We can only try things because there are no models.
We still do all kinds of funny things, like reading and writing, which is an unnatural act. Uh, we were designed to uh, spot a buffalo on the horizon and creep up and club it to death. This veneer of civilization is uh, a very recent arrival. So let's just move on the story and have a look at what happens next. The supercomputer that's the equal of you and I will arrive around about 2015. Uh, about 10 years after that, 2025, it'll be on your desk, and about five years after that, it'll be wearing us. Okay. Well, think about it. The only reason you take the dog for a walk, you're smarter than the dog, right? We worry at the laboratory about children, so we have a children's program. I originally called the program Experiments on Children, and I have to rapidly rename it because... <laughs> I had to rapidly rename it the customers of tomorrow and uh, probably the single biggest breakthrough will be when we all become journalists because we will all be wearing cameras and devices that can capture any event any time so we will be in the street look up see a car accident and it'll be captured so that can then be made a news item. That's probably the, the single biggest change that we'll see in the infeed of information. Across the whole of Europe, there is a different culture to the United States. In the USA, it's okay to try and fail. In fact, failure is a positive qualification. In Europe, if you try and fail, it can be a complete blight. not only predict the future, but we try and build it. We put the technology together to live 10 years ahead of the rest of the human race. And in doing so, we discover what works and what doesn't. And we get a continual diet of problems. So I am fed problems all the time. I think, I guess, and I experiment. So the ideas are founded on reality, but a reality 10 years out. And what I don't want to do is foist on the world technology and solutions that are not very good or they don't work. <laughs>